recording. Hi to the folks at home. <laughs> uh, happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year if you join us by, by video. Um, that all kind of seems like a vague memory to me now. <laughs> oh boy. In, in for a penny, in for a pound today. It's been happening. My, my email inbox was about two miles long. Um, but I'll stop complaining now. Um, has anybody, well, first things first, I hope that you have your preparation for the second assignment well in hand. I know that the, um, the sad Lee PM chat group is going off. They are super organised. <laughs> um, and uh, that they're going to be booking for a couple of huddles with me in the next uh, week or so. Um, if you do wish to uh, have a huddle, <laughs> then um, you know, please book one in with me, uh, with your study group. Um, the huddle is just a way for you guys to focus and hone your understanding of the case law um, in preparation for writing your oral submissions. Um, I put uh, notices up on Moodle about it and on Facebook. Um, and uh, this, this assignment really is not about, as I've been saying to you all along, it's not about um, finding some magic bullet case and keeping all of your research to yourself and, uh, you know, doing the usual law school thing. It is about, I mean, everybody pretty much knows what, what cases are relevant because I've told you. <laughs> um, so it's much more down to your own understanding of the principles and the cases and how elegantly you can construct your argument within eight to ten minutes um, and how convincingly you can present your client's case to the judge. Okay, so normally what will happen in an instructing solicitor's firm is that you will get designated research tasks and you'll go away and you'll research a certain area of the client's case and then everybody will get together <coughs> and you'll discuss or at least the partner should touch base with whoever's doing the grant work research to make sure that they are on the right track and to uh, try and hash out the best way forward for their client given the landscape of authorities that surround them. And so uh, if you have a study group that you are um, working with on this assignment, I am more than happy for you to book in a huddle with me uh, as your managing partner uh, to discuss the case law from your client's perspective. And in that meeting, I will be drilling you mercilessly <laughs> as to your understanding of the case law and potentially to expose the weaknesses in your understanding to help you work out where to focus your efforts in improving your understanding of, of the principles and the case law um, and hopefully constructing a very nice, elegant set of submissions. Now, having said that, um, as I've said in previous Zooms, I'm more than happy for people to study together, work together, um, come to huddles together with me. But your actual um, script at the end of the day and your oral submissions must be entirely your own. Yeah, my approach in assignment one was merciful. I was just setting you up for the fall, Keith. <laughs> um, no, the, look. The, the assessment here is much more on getting you to work on your presentation technique and your ability to make an effective argument 
from your client's point of view. So what you are trying to do here, we kind of, Keith's actually hit on something here because the first assignment did involve with that, um, uh, the unconscionable conduct side of things, um, the law wasn't in your client's favour, but you still nevertheless needed to go through Kirby's judgment because that was the highest and best that your client's case could have got out of that area of law. Now, I don't think that that would have saved it, but that's the kind of thing that you need to be doing when you are making a set of oral submissions, right? So you need to be trying to convince the judge to accept your arguments on behalf of your client, your perspective on the case law, making the highest and best case you can for your client, okay? So that is, uh, that is the approach for assignment two. Like I said, if you're, you know, organised and you want to come to to book in a huddle, that's fine. If not, that's also fine. Um, but what I will say is please do not just read your notes to me, okay? This, what I'm really going to be super mindful of is how you are presenting your client's case. Okay, so don't think of this as just another assessment. Think of this as a really neat way to hone your practical skills. Because your practical skills aren't just all up here, are they? It's not like the normal law school assignment where what's the only thing that I can look at is what you've put on paper to me. This really involves bringing your paper to life and having an, an, an actual conversation with the judge and trying to persuade them uh, on the basis of your interpretation of the landscape of case law that's out there that they should find in favour of your client. Okay? So that's what the second assignment is all about. Uh, it is due on the 18th. Let me just double check that because I'm pretty sure I've got it right. It was the 18th of Friday, the 18th of... Let's have a look. Yeah, it is the 18th and it's 11.45. Yes, 18th and it is 11.45. Unfortunately, yeah. I'm sorry, I hate doing that. 11.45 is horrible, but if you can get it done early, please do. Um, if you want to book in for a huddle, if you want to book in for a huddle, please do it in the next uh, week, okay? Please do it in the next week because I don't want to have huddles in that final uh, week, all right? So we are now at Wednesday the 2nd. I don't really want to be holding any more huddles after, you know, about Thursday the 10th. All right, so if you want to book in for one, book in for one before then. They'll be short and they will be fairly rigorous and ruthless. <laughs> you must, if you're going to book in for a huddle and I see that you haven't prepared or you don't know the cases and I'm not familiar with the cases, I'll ask you to leave the huddle because it's not designed as a free ride, okay? I won't be giving answers in the huddle. I will just be drilling you with questions. That's the point of a huddle. Alrighty? So that's the way that will work. Um, are there any other queries about assignment two? What sort of time frame do we need to allow? About 15 minutes, not long. It's short and sweet. And serious. <laughs> Have I scared you off yet, Diane? <laughs> That's why. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> yeah, I know. I am so scary, man. You should be scared. <laughs> oh, I couldn't be scary if I tried. I know. My kids are, my own children are not scared of me, unfortunately. Um, 
this way before you fried. Um, so that's that. Um, and now, can we get on to this week's cheat? Because it's super duper useful. Um, and what I would like to do is um, share my uh, now mm, 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 this one. Can I share? There we go. Can you see the document I'm sharing or not? Now let me just bring it over here. Let me just bring it over here because I think it's a little bit big. There we go. Uh, now, oh, you can't see it. We can't see it now, AJ. Oh, bother. So, my screen sharing is paused. Why is it paused? How do you unport resume share? Alt and T. Am I sharing now? <laughs> Woo Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, as you will know, termination is one of my favourite topics. <laughs> Insert additional exam hint here. Now, um, <coughs> I have said it to you before the break, but we've had a lot of partying going on since then. So uh, I will repeat it again for you. Uh, the main, main questions in the exam will be to do with termination. So please ensure that you um, are familiar with the concept of termination exceedingly well when you head into the exam. Um, just revising the main um, the main concepts in terms of termination. Well, before we do that, okay, before we do that, can I just have a little bit of honesty? I don't particularly care because it's not going to affect really what we say in our tutor tonight, but uh, how many people have managed to look at the topic of termination before tonight's tutor? I just have a, a Y or an N. I don't really mind. It's not going to really affect what I say. It's just. I've, uh, I've just read the the tweet notes. I haven't got any further than that. Okay. All right. So you've read the tutorial problem. The, the, just what just for a brief for a brief overview. Yeah. But what about everybody else? I have a, a Y or an N in the chat box. Oh, hang on a second. Yes, 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 yes. Halfway through. Cool. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> You're super organised. Way more than, than my contract A babies. They were kind of all at sea tonight. Um, okay. So then you can tell me, because <coughs> you know I'm sharing the first, the first part of it, but there are, um, there are a few different ways that you can... Uh, terminate firstly is at common law for breach of condition tell me some other ways that you might be able to terminate at uh, acceptably validly correctly rightfully repudiation yes if there has been a repudiation by the other party absolutely and the other way the third way is Yes, Leanne says uh, holidays are marvellous for catching up. <laughs> um, Leanne says anticipatory breach. Yes, now anticipatory breach is a form of what? Can we can we work out where where anticipatory breach belongs? It's a form of thanks. Yeah, it's a form of repudiation. So the other way, so we've got terminating at common law for breach of condition and we've got termination for repudiation and there's one other way. Super important. Uh, no. 
if the party's abandoned, then it's just discharged by abandonment. We, we say that a contract's discharged by abandonment. We don't say it's terminated by abandonment normally. One other way. That is a reason, Leanne's saying delay. Delay might be a reason for holding that there has been a repudiation. Melissa McBean, father perform an intermediate term. Ah, well, that would be a sub that would be a subset of uh, terminating for breach of condition because essentially if you've committed a fundamental breach of an intermediate term, it's going to be treated as a breach of condition. Wow, that's getting technical, isn't it? Keith Cornwell is saying convenience. I think you're nudging closer, Keith. What do you mean by convenience? <laughs> Sorry, can't type fast enough. If, a term in the con if there's a term in the contract that allows the contract to be terminated. Yes! Yes. So the third way is under the contract provision allowing termination. So there are your big three ways that will allow the, the three uh, events that will allow you to terminate correctly. Now, if you're going to terminate uh, under a termination for convenience clause, you absolutely must strictly comply with the procedure set out in the contract, don't you? Because if you do not, then you are at risk yourself of being held to repudiate. Because if you purport to rely on the contract and terminate the contract in a way that is not compliant with that termination clause, effectively, you've wrongfully terminated, you've wrongfully repudiated, and that allows the other party to accept your wrongful termination, your repudiation, and themselves to terminate. Okay? And that's where we start to get into, similarly to where we have a party that purports to terminate for breach of condition or breach of an essential term, the other party says, hang on a minute, the term you're purporting to rely on is not essential at all. Therefore, your, your conduct in purporting to terminate for breach of that term is itself a repudiation. I'm going to accept that and sue you for damages. Do you see what I mean? So this is what I call the dance of, of termination. You've got to be... Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, AJ. I got lost in that one. <laughs> DTR versus uh, Mona Holmes. Yeah. DTR nominees. Yeah. Yep, exactly. And it can get really tricky. So you've got to be super duper confident of the way that you are terminating, if you are terminating under a convenience clause, or the, the breach that you are purporting to terminate for. You have to be very uh, sure that it's an essential term or that all of the conduct that has gone on adds up together to a repudiation. And a repudiation is going to be very important your understanding of repudiation, shall I say, will be very important in about six weeks' time. Okay, so <clears throat> repudiation may be shown by a party not being ready, willing and able to perform the contract. So it comes down to unwillingness or inability. Okay. So when you're looking at unwillingness, there's a couple of different tests and they're different in nature to the kind of tests that you have for inability. 
So you need to be aware of that. So we're not looking at unwillingness tonight in our choose. We are looking at inability. But I will say again, unwillingness is going to be very important in about six weeks' time. So take that uh, little gem and file it away. Being unable to perform is a very serious situation to find yourself in, isn't it? So hence we have this test that you have to be wholly and finally disabled from performing the contract or there's a substantial inability to incapacity to perform. And this is where we have our lovely almond investors and koala tree. Do you think they mean, do you think that koala tree is like a, a pun for like koalas in a tree? I don't know. It just strikes me that it is. I always get a picture in my brain of koalas in a tree when I, when I look at that. <laughs> but it, <laughs> anything to get the pandas in. Yeah, you know, I'm shameless. Um, so in the Armand Investors case, before I just put it up there, can anybody uh, give me a, a brief rundown on what the facts of, of that case were? Armand Investors. What happened there? Obviously it involved um, almond trees. <laughs> Can you give me any more detail than, uh, than that? Why were they held to be wholly and finally disabled? And why is this relevant to anticipatory breach? Because remember we said when we were recapping things, anticipatory breach is a form of repudiation. Yeah, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but there was tens of thousands of trees and they had to be nine inches high, I think, from memory, or whatever the, whatever, there was a height measurement. And if the tree was under that, then there was a very high chance of disease or, or, or the tree was going to fail to grow. And uh, the nursery failed to provide the initial batch of trees, but there was a term in the contract that said they could reserve some. And they tried to rely on that term, but uh, the, the investor said, no, nah, you haven't provided the trees, you're not going to be able to provide them over the next two years, so we're out of here, forget it. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And if you think about it, <coughs> I'm just going to backtrack a bit. If we compare that case, um, and you were on the money there, Keith, in terms of the facts, um, if we compare that case to something like foreign and white, foreign and white, that was a case of express inability to perform. Can, can anyone just briefly give me a, you know, thumbnail sketch of foreign and white? What happened in foreign and white? That was the, can I, oh, sorry, is anyone typing in the, um, no. Foreign and white was the one where uh, Salem purchased the property. They were meant to, the vendors were meant, were meant to register a right of way. And two days before the settlement date, uh, the vendor solicitors rang up the purchasers and said, uh, sorry, we won't be able to register the right of way uh, before the settlement date. Now, the uh, purchasers didn't say, oh, this is an express uh, an express statement of inability to perform, that constitutes an anticipatory breach. That means it's a repudiation of the contract and therefore we accept that and elect to terminate. Instead, they did nothing. Yeah. Keith. Settlement date comes and goes. Neither party attends. 
Two days later, the purchasers uh, solicitors send uh, the vendor solicitors a, a letter saying, purchasers report to terminate because you couldn't pass good title to the property and you didn't register the right of way. Therefore, we want our deposit back. The court said, let's work out what happened here. Did they terminate for anticipatory breach? No, they did not. There was an anticipatory breach. Two days before settlement, they expressly said, we're not gonna be able to register. Then settlement came, nothing happened. There was no termination before then. Once settlement happened, once the time for performance had occurred, that anticipatory breach crystallised in the actual breach and so was no longer capable of being accepted as a repudiation. You had to then look at actual breach and they had terminated for the actual breach. Now, the seller's argument was, well, you didn't attend settlement, so you yourself were not ready, willing, and able to settle on the correct date. So therefore, you can't terminate. Yep. We are going to take that as a repudiation. And the court said no. Generally, the case will be if you don't accept an anticipatory breach and it crystallises into an actual breach, the person can rely on any, any other excuse that comes up to excuse their, their conduct in terms of the um, anticipatory breach. But then if the circumstances as they did in that case clearly signal to the other party that them tendering performance as required is going to be pointless, they're going to be excused from performing. And you can't say that they're going to be repudiating if they don't perform because the whole reason they're not performing is because you've told them it's going to be pointless for them to tender performance. Okay? So, again, why would they not request an extension? And this is what the court said. <laughs> <laughs> You're thinking like a lawyer, Diane. Yeah. Well, if the, what, why? I mean, if they maybe they really did want to get out of the contract, so by not requesting the extension, they forced they forced you know the other side to to not be ready, willing, and able, and the contract fell through. But really, they were sticking their neck out a very long way because if you if you communicate the fact that you cannot perform a, um, uh, a condition like that, um, there was every chance that they could lose the deposit. So... Uh, it doesn't make sense why they didn't ask for an extension of time to complete it. If that's, both parties wanted the contract to they said. That's what the court said. They, they specific, the court says the, this notice that was provided two days before the settlement date didn't ask for an extension. It just said, we can't perform on the settlement date. And normally in the give and take of contracts, that's what you would expect to happen. You know, you'd expect settlement to just be delayed. But uh, that's what happened. Purchasers wanted their money back and, uh, you know, it got ugly. Hmm. That, was, that was an express inability to perform that was communicated. Very different to um, Armoured Investors and Koala Tree where you had no express statement. It was just, as Keith said, this litany of facts that culminated in this big email from one party to the other party saying, oh, well, we propose to meet the contract in this way and we'll give you these plants that weren't actually planted at the time we said they'd be planted, but nevertheless, we've got them here, we can give them to you. Um, you know, they were, they were indicating in that email that there was just no way that they were going to be actually performing the contract. 
as had been agreed. So it was an implied inability to, to perform. They didn't actually say, we will not perform as required. That, they just said, Here, here's the situation, this is what we can do. And the other party said, no, sorry. Implied inability to perform. So all of the facts added up to the same thing as basically saying, we're not going to perform. So that was the uh, Armand Investors case. Now I want to unpack the Coca-Cola case because that's what the problem is based on. We're representing Coca-Cola in the circumstances of Hammer, Hammer and Barrow. At the time of the exercise, Hammer and Barrow have supplied their first round of yo-yos. Our client's not happy. Uh, and they want to, I know, Keith, they were great yo-yos. I had one. They were awesome. <laughs> Sorry, we're showing our age here. Um, okay, the client's not happy. They want to terminate. So what's the, what's the go here? Tell me about Hammer and Barrow before I scroll down. <laughs> Well, it's complicated. Yeah, it is complicated. It's a defective product that they supplied. Yes. And the product had been unsold from Coca-Cola to one of their bottling companies. Yes. The product was manufactured in Christchurch and due to be delivered in Auckland. Mm -hmm. And that's where the inspection was supposed to take place. Mm -hmm. And Coca-Cola, sorry, Hammer and Barrow argued that Coca-Cola on selling the defective product. There was no argument that it was a defective product. The argument was around whether the sale by Coca-Cola to the Coca-Cola bottlers uh, dealt with the product in such a way that it precluded Coca-Cola's rights to uh, terminate the contract. Yes. Yes. Did we all get that? <laughs> so... <clears throat> Place the order for 200,000 yo-yos. There was this big ad campaign by um, Coca-Cola. Ads everywhere with cool kids playing with their yo-yos. Everybody wanted one. I wanted to do the walking the dog. I, I managed to do it. There's certain tricks that you could do that became super duper popular. Um, Oh, there were all sorts of things. People, baby in a cradle, we kind of had the string in a triangle and the yo-yo was rocking in between. It was so cool. Um, you can tell we didn't have iPads, right, in our generation. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the first batch of yo and now, before I backtrack on that, it, there was a big ad campaign and that, cost Coca-Cola a lot of money and bound up with that whole notion of a big ad campaign was that Coca-Cola's reputation was on the line here. Because the whole point of a promotional ad campaign is to increase your reputation. If you then spend a whole stack of dollars on advertising this promotional campaign, these cool bananas, you know, new yo-yos that are so awesome, everyone will want one. They've got Coca-Cola plastered on both sides of the yo-yo. And then the yo-yos come out, they're rubbish. They won't run down the string freely or they won't do what they're meant to do. Kids are going to get really annoyed. And they're going, go, nah. what does that say about Coca-Cola? So their reputation was at stake here also. The first batch of yo-yos was uh, 85000 As Keith said, they were delivered to uh, first to Christchurch and then onwards to Auckland. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know challenge yo-yos. Interesting. Um, of those ones, about 80% were defective. 
particularly had problems with um, inability to freely run down the, the string. The other problem was just a crappy appearance. So again, that goes back to reputation, expenditure on uh, expensive ad campaign, that kind of thing. So there was more than half the yo-yos yet to be manufactured. Um, Coca-Cola refused acceptance and rejected the goods, put it to terminate for anticipatory breach, which is, as we said, a subset of repudiation. Um, Hammer and Barrow, uh, said that effectively, as Keith said, by Coca-Cola sending the yo-yos down to its uh, subsidiary company in, well, subsidiary agent in Auckland, that action constituted under the New Zealand sale of goods legislation, consti constituted acceptance of the goods. As such, then, because that was inconsistent with the seller's rights of ownership, uh, they should have to pay, all right? They couldn't now reject the items. So <clears throat> there were two issues. Firstly, could they terminate for anticipatory breach, which is what we're after tonight? And secondly, could they reject the goods already delivered? We don't really need to worry about that bit, although it makes interesting reading. So uh, the things that um, the court, the things, circumstances that the court pointed to in finding that they could terminate for anticipatory breach or repudiation. Uh, was the ratio, the sheer number of defective items that were delivered, more than 80%, I think it was 81% of the items delivered were defective, okay? The breach occurred at a very early stage and there was no evidence that improvements could be made quickly. Now, <coughs> that was very relevant because Bear in mind, any ad campaign is very time sensitive. You're going to get le least return for your money the longer the ad campaign goes on, right? You, you're going to get the maximum bang for your advertising dollar in that first initial period. And if you can't get the product out there after you've saturated with your advertising, you're not going to be able to get the return on investment that you had anticipated. So there was a time sensitivity there. Uh, the fact that it was all for an ad, ad, ad campaign was of great importance. Spence time, effort. So therefore they could decline to take the risk of further unsatisfactory performance. They could accept that anticipatory breach as a repudiation and terminate. Okay. Now. <coughs> if we go down here to our IRAC. <coughs> How, what's our, shall I start another, I'll stop sharing. All right, what I'm going to do is start a different document and let's just see if we can construct an IRAC ourselves um, I don't want to give you any unnecessary hints. <laughs> we need to be we need to be um, looking at our IRAX in terms of um, exam prep now. So. Um, Let's have a go. What's our issue? Can someone state a nice um, issue for me? Just a real pithy discussion. Can you see this? Uh, can you see the document that I've got, the blank document? Beautiful. So.
sorry, I've got someone jumping in here to the chat. Yes, now, uh, Diane saying, can Coca-Cola rescind contract? Hmm. Can you perhaps be a little more technically accurate? Yes, okay, keys added for anticipated breach. Uh, hammer and arrows number. Or you can just how about that? It might be just lagging, Keith. Is it appearing now? Oh, there's nothing? Hmm. That's weird. Which are you seeing a blank document? Oh, that's also weird. Okay. Hmm. What I will do oh someone saying something on the magic typeface. <laughs> Insert typing here. Um, so what I'll do is I'll stop, hang on, hang on, wait, now, do you see anything? Woohoo! Okay. Rules. So, hit me. You know what? I'm going to hit you. <laughs> and then we can work on the fun bit, which is the application. Okay. So, they're, they're the um, rules I would expect to see. You might, you might want to actually cut those down a bit more, really. You can terminate a common law for anticipated breach of condition on a contract. Party can also accept the other parties' repudiation. Repudiation. Progressive mailing house, please know this case. You will need to know. Please know this case. <laughs> okay. Repudiation occurs where a party by words of conduct indicates they're unwilling or unable to perform a whole contract or a fundamental obligation, an essential term. If the party's not really willing and able to complete, they're probably repudiated. The test is whether. A reasonable person would see the conduct as a renunciation of the whole contract or a fundamental obligation. Can you see that that's really just flipping this test on its head? Repudiation occurs where a party indicates they're unwilling or unable to form the whole contract or a fundamental obligation. So if they're unable to complete the whole contra contract or a fundamental obligation, they're probably going to have be held to have repudiated. You see what I mean? It's just flipping one on its on its head and back again. For an implied inability to perform, you have to be, as I said before, at, when we were recapping things, wholly and finally disabled. Anticipatory breach allows the other party to terminate prior to the time of performance. Okay, so how, how would you get going? I normally like to start by chucking in just a little quick discussion of principle, just to throw away, and you might want to, you know, edit this down or, I don't know, cut it out. But I thought anticipatory breach is a form of repudiation where a party shows they don't intend to be bound. This allows the innocent party to terminate immediately, even if the time for performance has not arrived. The breach has to be sufficiently serious to justify termination if it had occurred at the time for performance. So the conduct must indicate breach of an essential term or go to the root of the contract. 
with me so far? Which case then would we, because what I normally like to do then is go and discuss a case or two and then turn it all back and onto the facts and apply it to our own problem facts. So which are the cases that you would be pulling out for me to help you along your way? Remembering where acting for Hammer and Barrow. No, we're not. We're acting for Coca-Cola. <laughs> Just keep me on your toes, peeps. <laughs> What case would you part cite for me next? Well, I thought you might I thought you might perhaps mention foreign and right because right because um, it was a case of express inability to perform and then and it was also held to be an anticipatory breach and then you know do a little discussion of almond investors Almond investors, 90,000 trees, it's been 90 centimetres tall, 12 months old, planted 2006, delivery 2007. The delivery was specified as immediately, okay? First third was delivered. Some trees had problems with quality, they were rejected. The buyer refused and didn't pay for those. That invoice was still outstanding, so notice that the buyer there is in breach of a non-essential term themselves. Yeah. The email then from the seller suggested that the remaining deliveries would be met with 22,000 trees that didn't meet contract species because they were planted in 2007 for delivery the next year, 2008, rather than planted in 2006, okay? Arm um, investors claimed that the email constituted repudiation, which they accepted. Of course, if a party is going to be held to repudiate, that has to be shown to be wholly and finally disabled. The email indicated essentially that they were wholly and finally disabled. Yes? That wasn't their admission. They they were attempting to say we can still meet our contractual obligations by doing X. Yes. But their uh, interpretation, much like uh, minor, minor, DDR nominees and minor homes, their interpretation of that contractual provision was erroneous. And I think it was strained at best, really. Yeah, it was certainly strained. Yeah. Um, but with co with uh, they weren't um, trying. They weren't trying to be. Uh, they were trying their best to perform. The difficulty, I think, was that they just got themselves into deep water. They got. They promised what they could not deliver. That that was the problem, and they were trying to make the best of a bad situation. But the difficulty was. And, and I haven't put it here, but um, delivery was uh, to be immediately. Mm -hmm. So that was a big thing mm -hmm. because they never had, they were never able to deliver as, as they promised to deliver. And, you know, I think even though the email was a good faith gesture to say, look, can we still get around this? The problem was that it was a documentary piece of evidence that showed that they simply could not perform essential contract terms. And that's why it was an implied anticipatory breach. Okay. So now, did I say here, you could probably add in here, so 
it wasn't express. It was just the facts together all showed that they, there was just no way they were going to be able to perform. And Hammer and Barrow was the same? Yeah. Yep. So what, what I do here in my little kind of answer guidey thing, and then I, I, I want to conclude on that and then I just want to give you a bit of a brain teaser. So I say, um, where are we? In Arm and Investors, there was obviously no expressly stated inability like foreign and white. Here in the Coca-Cola case, there is likewise no expressly stated inability to perform. They haven't said we can't supply yo-yos that fit the stipulated conditions. However, like Arm and Investors, we have a contract for delivery of presentable working yo-yos. There was actual delivery of 40%. Of this, 81% were effective. Plus, there was a lagging in the remainder of the delivery. There was some time sensitivity because of the advertising situation. Also, in Almond Investors, there was that agreement um, plus time sensitivity as well in terms of the, when the trees were meant to have been planted. In the Coca-Cola case, uh, the, the advertising was only going to last a certain time. Uh, was, was this defective delivery an implied repudiation or anticipatory breach of the contract in these circumstances? And then I've just proceeded to unpack and apply everything that we have been talking about. So this will occur if the party demonstrates that they're not ready, willing and able under Hoxter, Hoxter and Delatour. You have to be wholly and finally disabled, armed investors. Here, obviously, it's likely because the court actually did hold that Hammer was impliedly wholly and finally disabled because of the huge number of defective items and because it occurred at an early stage and there was no evidence that improvements could be made quickly. The fact that you've got this ad campaign that was expensive, you've got issues of reputation and prestige floating around into the mix here as well. So they could decline to take the risk of further unsatisfactory performance. And therefore, I concluded, as I think we all have, and the court did in that case, Coca-Cola could accept the repudiation and terminate. That's how I would construct an IRAC for implied inability to perform. Okay? Because that was that was essentially what was at issue in, in that case. As I said, I want you to be super duper, and I'll, I'll put this all up as I normally do for you so I can stop sharing now. <coughs> I just want to throw it out there though, a couple of things. We need to be clear on the issue of unwillingness to perform, particularly in terms of our exam prep and progress the progressive mailing house case, because as I said, there's different tests that apply to that branch of the law. So you need to be familiar with those tests and you need to be able to work out when repudiation will occur, where there have been cumulative breaches like there were in progressive mailing house, okay? So that's one thing I want to chuck out there for you. The other thing I wanted to chuck out for you was this whole, and I don't mind if you, if you have to nick off and you're getting bored. <laughs> that's fine if you need to have dinner. So, you know, I, I, I won't turn off the recording just yet in case there are people that are um, intrigued to, to listen to this discussion, but I just wanted to pursue this with you. What about 
if in Hammer and Barrow, let's just change the scenario because I want to traverse some of the other stuff that you've read, all right? What if there was only, say, let's be really difficult, at a 10 or a 20% defect rate? What would your strategy be then? Rules of thumb. <laughs> Rules of thumb. Your strategy would be to say, so what Hammer and Barrow were asking for was recovery of the contract price. Now, remember that where Coca-Cola had on for most of the items that had been delivered to Coca-Cola, they could just repudiate the contract and avoid payment. They could send the items back and repudiate the contract. However, there were 51 boxes that had been sent from Coca-Cola to the Auckland subsidiary and by the Auckland subsidiary out to the local shops. They had to pay for those. Right? Now, what about here instead of there being an 80 something defect rate, like I said, what if there was only a very low defect rate? How would that affect Hammer and Barrow's argument to say, hang on a minute, we think that we should be paid for what was given to you. If there was only, I'll make it easy. First step, I'll make it easy. Then I'll get hard, all right? Say there was 10% effect. And I'm thinking of a specific case here. And I'm thinking of the readings that you did around recovery of contract price for substantial performance. It would not be essential breach. It would be. It would just be fewer number of essential breaches. So you would still have an essential breach. But then the, the focus shifts from the classification of the breach as essential or not essential or as repudiation or not repudiation shifts from that arena to the other arena that we looked at for week six which is not not that you wouldn't have repudiation but it, you would have yeah because you would have you would still have breach there right but the nature of the discussion would more likely shift to the forum of have you substantially performed that term? So in week six, we looked at performance. And this is where things get nifty because if the, if the breach had only been quite minimal in terms of the numbers of defects, you could say, well, yes, there has been some breach of this condition and yes, the condition might be essential, but we have substantially performed. So in a way you're right, we've still, Melissa and Keith, you're still, you're right in that the argument wouldn't technically be we're not repudiating, it would be we have performed and therefore what you guys are saying in brackets, there's no repudiation or there's no breach of a central condition. <coughs> Do you see what I mean? So the nature of 
your focus shifts then back to has there been substantial performance. So if, if there had been a 10% defect rate, think back to Henig and Isaacs and Bolton and Mardiva. Now remember, Henig and Isaacs was the case where, <coughs> pardon me, Denning sat on uh, the case where there was a, a contract to decorate a flat, <coughs> refurbish a flat, and it was 700 and something pounds. And then the work was done, the guy took possession back of the flat, was having the use of everything, and then said, nah, don't want to pay. There's been a, a breach of an essential, there's been no performance, no acceptable performance. You no longer have a PA. Wardrobe drawn bookshelf needs to be fixed. That's right. Minimal, minimal amount that it took to reinstate the flat to the conditions required. About 10% odd rectification costs. Bolton and Mardiv, I remember, that was the installation of the central heating. <laughs> and the gas was, remember, the fumes were leaking into the rooms <coughs> and it wasn't working correctly. And it was, it was about a 30 odd percent uh, remediation cost. And the court said there, no, you can't recover the contract price because there was no substantial performance. Right? So if there had been a lesser defect rate, you may find then that the nature of your argument would not be over, can we uh, terminate for repudiation or terminate for breach of an essential condition, the other party would come back with, we you know, we've performed. It wasn't ideal, but we've performed. Could then negotiate a deduction price. They, I think that they, tr I'm trying to argue if there was an offset. I'm trying to think if there was an argument of offset in either of those. You would, you would argue an offset. Um, but the question is whether it could get that far. Because you're not going to be able to argue for an offset unless there's something to argue about. And if you, if the court is saying that you're not entitled to recover at all because there's been no substantial performance. Do you see what I mean? You're going to have to get over the hurdle of the court finding that there's been substantial performance first and then the court will make the order as to the price that's paid and it will most likely take into account the remediation cost. But here's where it gets a bit mind-bendingly, it's like time travel. <laughs> if the remediation cost is too much to start with, the courts back here, when the court's trying to work out whether there's been substantial performance or not, they'll say, no, there hasn't been substantial performance. You know what I mean? That they will factor in that amount of remediation work required. They'll factor that in right at the very beginning. So you won't even get to the nitty gritty of that unless you get over that hurdle of substantial performance. Okay? Does that make sense? <laughs> Mind bending, isn't it? I know. But the court will, when they're trying to work out if there should be any recovery, you've got to get over that hurdle of 
satisfying the court that there has been substantial performance. And in order for the court to say, yes, there has been substantial performance, that remediation cost that you're going to fight about later will factor into the earlier decision as to whether or not there's been substantial performance. Because in Bolton and Mardiva, they said 30% is too much. So we're going to hold that there's not even been any substantial performance, so there's no recovery of contract price, so you don't even get to haggle about whether there's an offset down, down the track. Do you see what I mean? You can't even recover any contract price at all unless there's that been that substantial performance. Make sense? I know if you look at it kind of with your head on the side and one eye shut. <laughs> How do the courts determine what is like the one that said it's thirty percent, ten percent's not like wouldn't be substantial, thirty percent. How would they determine what is substantial and what isn't substantial? Is it an objective based on the facts? Yes, absolutely. And this is what um, Wilmot actually really struggle with. And it's one of the few the few times in Wilmot where I've noticed that they actually kind of throw up their collective hands and say, yeah, it's, it's how long is a piece of string? We know that 10% is probably going to be okay from Henig and we know that 30-odd percent is going to be too much from Bolton and Mardiva. Then the difficulty level is increased again because it doesn't just depend on what the rectification costs will be. It does depend, like you say, on the individual circumstances of each case and how serious the breach itself was because they say if the breach is fairly minor and the rectification cost is minor, you'll probably have substantial performance, like in Hennig and Isaacs, and you'll then haggle over how much will be paid. They'll get the contract price less than the remediation amount. That much is clear. But what happens, they say, if the breach is very minor, but the rectification cost is a little more, say 20%, smack halfway between Heenig and Bolton. What will the court do? They say, really, there's not a whole lot you can say about that, except that it will turn on the facts of the case. They do say where the breach is major of the nature that would allow you to terminate. So here, you notice the conversation is now swinging back to issues of termination, not issues of performance. So they say here, if the breach was major and you could terminate, but the rectification cost was small, in their guesstimate, you probably wouldn't be able to recover any because the breach would allow you to terminate. So even if the rectification cost was small. So they say it's down to the facts, really, and whether or not the breach was of such magnitude that you could terminate for that. So can you see there's this nice little pendulum of how, and, and, and I like this problem because it makes us recap what we did in, in week six in a way and put it into a very practical scenario because <clears throat> if you just tweak the problem terms a little bit, you, you say, well, look at this pendulum. You, you can have arguments of substantial performance that creep into an assessment of whether there's going to be termination or no termination. And similarly, you will have issues of termination that might creep into an argument of whether there's going to be substantial performance and therefore recovery of the contract price or not. So it's a, it's a nice little problem to have. And I'm sorry that there's been a little bit of an extra time, as there normally is, um, but I just thought it was an interesting uh, recap to show we haven't completely forgotten what happened in week six. 
<laughs> before all the partying went on. <laughs> anyway, what do we think of all that? Keith mentioned another case there. Good job, Keith. What are we, are we happy with that, roughly? Cool, oh, I'm nervous. Okay, um, any other further questions? I'm mindful of, I'll turn off the, um, I will turn off the recording now.